what happened since the government sort of was formed and the initiation of uh, the judicial changes, the, the regime change in Israel, we saw something that was unbelievable because the way the government or the way the, the, the regime in Israel, the, the democratic regime in Israel is that the government has a lot of power and the government basically has, uh, it's a coalition government, so the, it has power over the parliament and can do basically whatever it wants because parliament is a very weak uh, proponent of uh, the Israeli democratic system. And once you have a government and you have a majority in parliament, then really you can do anything you want, except for uh, uh, if, you, if the government does things that the Supreme Court in Israel, which is a very conservative Supreme Court, you know, it's known to be the liberal one, but very conservative on many issues uh, and very supportive of the government and doesn't like to interfere in government. So you can do whatever you want unless the Supreme Court in Israel says that it's unconstitutional or something that's completely out of lines uh, in, in the human rights terms or, or something like around these things. It rarely happens. And uh, why, why this is so unprecedented what's happening is because since the government started charging with changes to the, the, uh, to the system in Israel in order to have absolute power over whatever they do and really to move us into uh, a non-democracy, to a dictatorship in, in many ways, we saw the civil unrest. We saw that all groups in Israel, apart from, I would argue, one uh, or a couple, but the basically one group of people, all of the groups inside Israel, all the elites from the military to the economic, to the education, to the judicial, to the civil society, all the groups inside Israel, <clears throat> feminist groups, uh, Mizrahi groups, uh, really from all society were opposing what the government was trying to do. And eventually, eventually le leading the government to pause and say, wait, we're, we're halting this for the time being. If it's still a threat, we can, we'll, we'll continue with this right after Passover. Once we return from a break that the parliament has, we will return in this, but we are willing to discuss this and we managed to stop it. Now, I'll just say that people like me, like many others are very skeptical. And think that the government is still intent, is still very, uh, will still intend, is still intends to continue with uh, their plans to to really damage Israel's democracy. Nevertheless, in technical terms, it could have done it now, and it didn't because of all this massive pressure that the Israeli society sort of imposed, uh, leading uh, to the last you know, demonstration that happened. What day was it? Today is is what's the Sunday, Monday, Sunday night was it or Monday? Huge protest that came, uh, you know, after the prime minister declared that he will fire the minister of defense. After the minister of defense, sort of from the Netanyahu's party, you know, said that this is a danger to Israel's security, and this is unprecedented in so many levels because on the one hand, the prime minister declared that he'll fire the defense minister for, you know saying the dangers to Israel's security, so being professional. On the other hand, it was also unprecedented because think of people like us from the liberal camp, we immediately went to protest over a firing of a minister of defense and a firing for a minister of defense for the Likud party, and we were opposing this. It, it, it's really hard to grasp all of it together. And nevertheless, this is sort of like the, the last sort of thing that, that caused everybody to group people who were just saying this is unbelievable, it's crazy times in Israel. And I think it halted it for the time being. And now we're entering a time where we don't know where it will lead. Uh, there are negotiations now in the, the president of Israel, who is a more symbolic sort of figure, is taking sort of ownership over the negotiations over this. And we will see where, where they will head once, uh, once parliament resumes and, and if there will be any consequences from these negotiations. Thank you. So, you know, one of the pieces I want to make, make sure we get to um, because it's, it's really, I, I think it's how we titled this webinar, what we started with, you know, Israelis are out on the street chanting, you know, Demokratia. People are, um, people who've never been mobilized like this before are coming out, you know, many of them for different reasons. I think overwhelmingly the broadest response is that, you know, for many Jewish Israelis, they are feeling their rights threatened either for the first time or in a different way. But there is a, a strong and important anti-occupation block, and, and you and Shalom Akshav have been key leaders of that. Um, and you know, 
for us, it for me, I should say it's it's very clear when you look at this that you know there are lots of bad things that would happen if this moves forward, right? You know, various government parties want to impose gender segregation on public transportation. They want to outlaw pride parades and legalize you know anti-LGBT discrimination on religious grounds. They want to do all kinds of bad things. But at the heart and soul, the core of this is about the occupation and about the fact that as you know, as as illiberal as it has been at times, it is the court that to date has stopped this government and BB in previous in incarnations from going ahead with annexation. It's the court that has the power to say to them, no, you can't just declare our eternal, you know, sovereignty over everything, by the way, without extending citizenship. You know, so talk a little bit about about that question about, you know, do I mean, do you think that that's right, that the issues of occupation are, are at the core? Now, I'm not, I'm not talking about the, at the core of the protests. I'm talking about the core of the action by the government. So I think that this is tricky. And I think it, the, the, the answer could be simple. It could be complex. And I'll try to give what I think is a more nuanced sort of answer to this. What is very clear is that there are four forces that were pushing the government to the, the, uh, in their attempt to change the regime in Israel. And one of them were the ultra-Orthodox, who wanted basically uh, uh, not to serve in the Israeli military by law. And they wanted uh, discrimination uh, on, on several levels in order that they could sort of discriminate between women and men in, in the public sphere, it's something that the court prevented them to do. Uh, the other uh, was Netanyahu, uh, who for his personal sake wants to, you know, he's under court, he's under trial, he wants to uh, remain out of court, out of trial, he wants to, that was his, his personal sort of wishes. Stay out of jail. Then, stay out of jail card, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. And then you have, uh, you have the people who are pushing it from the Likud, so the Minister of Justice in Israel, who has an ideology of changing the Supreme Court, doesn't believe in, in the judicial system in Israel, thinks it's too powerful, wants to give the court, the, the, the parliament, the power over the judicial. So there's an ideological element to this. And finally, the fourth group, which interests me the most, interests the peace camp the most, are the national religious, the settler movement, uh, which you refer to in, in your sort of uh, remarks, who really want what you sort of hinted or, or stated, they want to go full on with annexation. And the Supreme Court in Israel is, it's hard to say that it's preventing them from doing so. You could say that it's restricting them to some degree, uh, but largely speaking, it's a very small one. And so there are some specific things that they couldn't do because of the Supreme Court, but they're very small. And in the, in the broader picture, you know, one from, from, from our point of view would ask, you know, why are they even going there? You know, they can do basically what, so they can't do 100% of what they want, they can do 95% of what they want. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's what's interesting, what the, what the settler sort of ideology is, and this is sort of the bigger picture, is that the Supreme Court is not a factor here because they want the whole land of Israel for the Jewish people uh, without rights to the Palestinians. And then you don't need a liberal institution that prevents them from going full on with their ideology. Now, on the other hand, so that's very clear why they would push for this. And, and, but on the other hand, their main ambitions in this government is to promote this agenda and they're succeeding so far. And while the demonstrators, uh, the large majority of the demonstrations are demonstrating against what they fear for their sake of rights. So that will restrict the Jewish rights within Israel, uh, things, policies, and practices in regards to the occupation have so far continued smoothly. Uh, they have advanced over 7,000 housing units since settlements throughout the entire West Bank. They have declared to legalize 15 outposts to take an illegal sort of settlement, which the settlements are all illegal in inter international law, but then you have the outposts which are also illegal according to Israeli law. They want to retro, so they declare that they will retroactively legalize 15 of them, which is both recognizing 15 new settlements and also giving practical means to this. So once an elf is severely or uh, rarely, relatively small, it will become a, a big settlement once they retroactively legalize them. Right. They have changed the a law uh, that regarded the disengagement. So Israel disengaged from the Gaza Strip in 2005, but they also disengaged from the north part of the West Bank. And what the Israeli parliament legislated now was a law to say, well, you know, the part of the north of the West Bank, we're canceling that. We're, we're going to build 
new settlements now in the north part of the West Bank as well. And if you'd want, I can refer to that or expand on that later because this is a significant move that they managed to do, which also got attention uh, by the US administration. And now recently, they also transferred powers to Smotrich, who is the Minister of Finance, who, if you've been following the news in the US a couple of weeks ago, did not meet with anyone from the Biden administration. Uh, had very poor English, which got a lot of people mocking him, but nevertheless is one of the more clever and ideological individuals in regards to the uh, uh, settlements and the annexation policies. And he also took upon himself and received a ministerial position within the Ministry of Defense. And that position granted him a lot of powers that was never given before to anyone uh, outside of the Ministry of Defense. And that's, that's uh, and I can give examples, but one of the things that he's doing, for example, he got authority over the civil administration. So the body that's responsible for the settlers. So legislation will be under, for the settlements, for the settlers will be under his, is now under his supervision. The advancements of settlements is solely under his supervision. So a lot of things are, are going on actually in regards to this, that the settlers are, are succeeding and receiving and, and managing to achieve. Nevertheless, which is going a little bit under the radar. So maybe I'll pause here. And, and yeah, one of the things that I, I do want to come back to is the disengagement that you talked about. Um, and you flagged it that, you know, it, it's gotten interest in the U.S. It's gotten interest in the U.S. not only because we and others and folks in the administration care, but because that was a negotiated, signed agreement with the United States. That wasn't just something that the Israeli government decided to do. That was an agreement uh, with then President Bush. And so in, in going back on that agreement, um, you know, that's another, in, in terms of the uh, interactions, minimal though they've been recently between Netanyahu and, and Biden, you know, that's, that's another sort of strike that the Biden administration, uh, you know, saw as, not saw as it is clearly going back on this agreement. Um, you know, do you think, again, that the people protesting around this, the people engaging the protest around this are, are you know, are a small part. Um, but when it comes back to that disengagement law and it comes to the bigger questions of what you're trying to, you know, of what the government's trying to do, how central do you think that is? I think that, uh, again, there's, there's the, the four forces that are pushing for their interests and the, I think the most, the strongest push right now are, are is Netanyahu and the ideological forces within the Likud, they're the most, because the settler movement, they want this because they see the Supreme Court as a burden, but they also understand that power for them is much more important because they can still succeed in most of what they want with the current legal system in Israel. So for them, if you look at like the balance of power for them, is they really want to maintain in power in order that they can promote annexation and settler policies over the West Bank. And, and I want to say something about the demonstrations because the, what the government is doing right now or their attempt uh, to change the judicial system inside Israel is huge. It's, it's, you can't underestimate it. It's not, it's, it's severe. It's really to, to make Israel into a dictatorship. It's to to, to dismiss completely the Israeli Supreme Court, what they want to do is they want to promote the, you know, that the government, who not only has power over the parliament, will also have power over the judges. And it's un and they can do then whatever they want. Really, any imaginary law they want to think of, the government uh, could decide to do, and, and they could do from extending elections for once every 10 years or to dismiss or cancel a, a Palestinian Arab parties within Israeli parliament to anything you can, one could imagine, uh, if they would have success, if they will be successful in what they're doing. Now, the positive thing about this is really what we saw all the various groups that really managed to, you know, in, in a way, it's, it's a very optimistic moment because you're saying, no, look, the Israel society gets it and are opposing it and they won't succeed. If they will do any of these harmful legislation, then, you know, there will be a general strike, the military will collapse, the high-tech in Israel would, uh, would strike. It, it won't, they, they won't succeed to do this. Now, the challenge, and now another positive thing is, is that the public that's demonstrating, so this liberal camp all of a sudden grouped in and started demonstrating against this, and naturally, they also started demonstrating against the national religious leadership. 
against Smotrich, against Ben Gvir, against the settler movement. They started saying, look, you, you know, what you're doing in the occupied territories, we don't want it inside Israel. We're not willing for this inside Israel. You know, all your messianic and sort of uh, uh, beliefs, don't, don't impose it on us. We're not willing for this to do. And at some point, a couple of weeks ago, there was a real pogrom in, in Khawar, in a Palestinian village uh, or almost city in the occupied territories in the north part of the West Bank, a pogrom by Israeli settlers, horrifying, you know, burning of houses, burning of cars, in the middle of the night, a severe settler violence of throwing of stones. And the, Israeli, the Israelis who were demonstrating all of a sudden started shouting at the police who uh, 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 were, you know, were, were in, 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 while demonstrating, they were shouting at the police, where were you at Khawar? Why weren't you defending the Palestinians at Khawar? Why weren't you, you know, uh, uh, preventing the settlers, the violent settlers from doing this program against Khawar? And this was a natural sort of evol evolution of the demonstrations. Yeah. And so on the one hand, this is very optimistic that you're seeing that a lot of the values that the liberal camp, the Jewish liberal camp who's demonstrating right now, all of a sudden are saying, look, if there's, you know, if, if we want values for women's rights and we want values for gay rights and we want values for uh, 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 education and we want values for uh, people with disabilities, then we also want and then you, you, can, you also need to grant these values to all people under the Israeli regime, so to Palestinians as well. So that's the optimist side. The negative side is that this is still very, there's still a dissonance, and the connection is still not there completely, and there's still a huge gap that we need to sort of fill in in order to make these, to connect it with Palestinian rights and under the occupied territories. Yeah, so that leads actually right into some of the questions that have been asked. Um, you know, some of it is about whether you, I'm trying to bring bring together a few of the questions, you know, whether you think that they're, that the protests have served to help build awareness, like you're talking about more broadly. And, you know, and I, I'll tag on, you know, what are you and Shalom Akshav and our, our other colleagues in the field, you know, what are you thinking about? What are you trying to do to capture that momentum and to bring people along the spectrum, right? From just standing up to protest for their own rights. And we, we see the same, same spectrum here, you know, to understanding the importance of, as you're saying, you know, human rights for all, in, including Palestinians, you know, both Israeli citizens, but also in the West Bank. And I'm just gonna throw in a second question so you can take them all together. There's that piece, but also a couple questions here about, you know, what I refer to as the compromise between Bibi and Ben Gvir. And what exactly is the compromise and particularly the element of, you know, it's now been announced that there's going to be created an 1800 person uh, militia that is going to apparently report to Ben Gvir. So can you talk a little bit about what, what your understanding is of what that is and what it might do, why he's doing that? Okay. So as regard for your first question, this is a really interesting point time to be at peace now and to be at the sort of the pro-peace sort of camp, the anti-occupation camp, because we're trying to figure it out. Because on the one hand, we are seeing that the, the liberal camp inside Israel is regrouped. It's understanding that the national religious leadership is leading Israel to a place that they don't want to be, that they don't share the same values with them, that it's dangerous. Uh, you had people who were, you know, from the from the the heart of the military uh, leadership, saying that the settlers are leading us to an apartheid state, uh, unprecedented remarks against them. So this is really a moment that people are, are understanding this, are understanding that their agenda is in regards to the occupation is not something that Israelis from the liberal camp want, and yet on the other hand, they still perceive the two-state solution is something that is you know, not relevant, not necessarily connected, that the occupation is still something afar, that they want, all they want is to go back to the place of right before the government was formed and started the division. So there's still a lot of things that, you know, it's, it's uh, contradictions in what's happening right now. On the one hand, there's a moment. On the one hand, there's political education that's, that's unwrapping. And on the other hand, there's still many gaps and it, not everything is being connected. For example, it's the Palestinian flag. Uh, if you go to the demonstrations, which are really hopeful and so and optimistic in so many levels, and, and the mar and and you still don't see Palestinian flags there. And if you would see a Palestinian flag, that you would it will mostly 
be either where we demonstrate for the pro-peace anti-occupation groups, or it would be, it would cause frustration for the majority of others. So if you go to the heart of the demonstration, people will be frustrated and say, why are you bringing the Palestinian flag here? What does this have to do with the judicial change that the government is doing? You're just sort of uh, hogging on or, or, or jumping onto this demonstration, it has nothing to do with this. So there's still a lot of work to do. And what we're trying to do is really figure it out. How do we make this really pivotal point in time and to capture it and to make, utilize it to the best of our sort of needs? Because one must ask this liberal camp, so, and its leaders, so Lapid and Gantz and the labor and, and all others, so imagine like a hypothetical question. Imagine that we completely win and we prevent the government from initiating, from succeeding in the judicial changes. What's the future of the state of Israel? What, what is the future if you, if you continue with the settlements with the Palestinians being under occupation without a two-state solution? Is this a democracy? Is this where you want to be? This, is this what we intend or we, we wish for our children, etc.? So that's sort of the, the big challenge that we have. Now, in regards to Ben Greer, I must say that I still don't know. We're still learning. Like the, what you just said, it's, it's coming out really right now. It hasn't been approved yet. There's more, a lot more question marks than, than things that are clear in, in what Ben Greer uh, is, 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 uh, is, is going to receive. Uh, one could be skeptical because he was given this promise before. Now it's signed on a paper, so maybe it's more, but he was given this promise. Is that, what, what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't necessarily mean that he will receive it. There's still a lot of things that could happen that he will actually not receive it. That, and, and then the negative side that if he'll receive it in, in what we fear is that will happen is really is to create a police unit under Ben Greer, which is unbelievable. It's, it's, it's almost unheard of. It will be like- It's, a, ter it's a, terrifying, a, a, frankly. It's, it's terrifying. It's to have like a, a, an authoritative unit directly under him, separate from the police. It's like you'll have two different police functions one uh, more independent and the other uh, under uh, Ben Gvir. I, I must tell you that I don't know, I, I don't, it's hard for me at this point to say that I believe that he will go full way with this, but who knows, things are really changing rapidly, like fast, and, and things, that, things that we couldn't believe a couple of weeks ago did eventually happen, so we don't know. But so this could potentially be a big danger. On the other hand, it could also, you know, completely, uh, like we, we could forget about it in a couple of weeks. I don't know where this will head up. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned, I mean, we're talking about the, the compromise there and you mentioned President Herzog's efforts to bring uh, the different different sides together. So first of all, I, you know, I just want to throw out, I mean, it's interesting because when you say bring the sides together, it's not two sides, right? You've got BB and the government, You've then got the political opposition led, as you said, by Lapid and Gantz, maybe they invite the Labour Party. That's not the protesters who are, of course, not being invited to sit at the president's home. Um, but given, given that the protesters are not being invited, we still have got what I think is a very smart question, which is what sort of compromise do you think could possibly be achieved in Herzog's talks? And specifically, this is uh, Marty Bressler, one of our board members, asking, what would you, Shalom Akshav, accept as a compromise? Look, it's hard. It's hard for me to say, and I think nobody knows, because this is really a trap that there's so many forces at play that, again, because there are four forces, four major forces from the government side that's pushing, that has an interest in this, uh, you can't possibly win three of them. So you can get you can you can get the ultra orthodox perhaps to compromise the, the the president already suggested a compromise that by law we will enable discrimination that ultra orthodox by law will not serve and this will be like a, you know we're legalizing the fact that ultra orthodox uh, which is a large population in Israeli uh, society the Jewish society will not serve in the military and we will just sort of live with this uh, you know we will legalize an illegal situation uh, of discrimination you could possibly win the, the ideologics from the Likud by not, but just not giving them what they want. So they will lose, they're weak under Netanyahu. And if Netanyahu retreats from this, then they'll back down and they'll support him largely. That's so we think, but possibly not, but maybe this, this can be a scenario. And then the national religious, the Zionist uh, uh, settlers or the ultra the nationalist sort of settlers, uh, the national religious parties, who, as I said, they want 
They don't want the Supreme Court, but they can live with it as long as they're in power and they can do 99% of what they want anyways. So you'll give them promises, you'll allow them settler construction, you'll allow them uh, uh, to create an apartheid system in the West Bank. The Supreme Court rarely interrupts anyways. So they'll get what they want, they'll stay in power. And then the big question is Netanyahu because he wants the out of jail card and he, he needs to <laughs> retract democracy in order to receive it. So will they find a compromise that will get Netanyahu out of jail some way to can Hard to believe at this point, really hard to believe. And I think from the, the, those who, you know, from the political camp that are now negotiating, they do understand that they can't accept things that will, uh, you know, that are red lines in the sense of the democratic system inside Israel. So you can't allow the government to choose the judges, for example. You can't dismiss the judicial, the, the legal advisor's opinion. So one of the things that they want to do is to say that legal opinions are, you know, are just recommendations and you don't have to abide by it. Although then the legal, you know, in Israel, the legal advisors of the ministries, you know, they, they work, they're the group that interprets to the minister what the law is. So if they say this is illegal, you can't promote it. And they're saying, oh, this is just a recommendation and, and we can, so these sort of different nuances and so you, there's something that's very clear even to the political system, to the political opposition inside Israel, that what are red lines of a democracy, and I think they won't go as far. The difference between, I think, them and the protesters is that one, uh, the political sort of opposition is much more, uh, you know, they have a, like a statementship role. They have to show that they're more serious, that they're more mature. And if the president is invited in to negotiate, then he must be there. Uh, and the protesters, on the other hand, are saying, uh-uh, no, we know Netanyahu. We know that he fools everybody. He gets what he wants anyway, and he'll just trickle you, and he'll get, uh, and he'll get them into trouble. They'll start you know, fighting with each other, and he'll sort of blame game. He'll recruit one person within, and the other. So they don't, they don't need that. They don't need to stay loyal to sort of the president and to be in that sense. They, could be, they, they can call it for what it is. And, and, and on the other hand, they are also... Uh, they also have the leverage to sort of to talk about things that might seem less significant in the broader picture, uh, which are still very significant. For example, they were criticizing, we were criticizing the politicians for going to the negotiations while giving Ben Greer this sort of little police unit, right? And so that's what they have, they can do whatever they, they can use this, they don't, they don't have to stick to sort of the president and they are, they're much more independent in their cause. And this is also something that was very interesting throughout this period is that the demonstrators really was, it was an authentic group without politicians. The, the, the people who were leading the demonstrations were not the politicians in any way. Politicians were dreaming of to speak in the demonstrations. They were, you know, they were really the, the second actors in this play. Uh, so I think that's sort of the, the differences. And, but, but largely speaking, we don't know. A, a key point that I would be looking at right now that I'm, I'm sort of very uh, uh, curious about is how Saturday night will be. Will the general public not go to protest or will, it, will, the, will we go and protest? And there are a lot of things coming into this, but is the general public in Israel, the liberal camp, protest now for 12 straight weeks in figures that are unprecedented? Will they say, okay, let's give it a chance? At the end of the day, the government did not promote the demonstration, the, the judicial changes. Let's, you know, we, we, we received 90% of what we wanted. Or will they go with the leadership of the protests and say, oh, we don't trust Netanyahu, unless they back down on some of the things, of the things that they already did, unless they promise to halt it altogether. So we'll be smarter on Saturday night and we'll see where this heads up. So this is a terrible thing to do to you because no one can know the answer, but what do you think happens Saturday night? Do you think you'll be big numbers somewhere in between? What do you think? So again, I don't know. I think sure. it, 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 there's a lot of unrest and, and a lot of things could change until then. So for example, Netanyahu hasn't fired the Minister of Defense quite yet. So if he does fire him, this could cause <laughs> people to say, okay, he's still promoting this agenda. We'll go protest. If he backs down, and maybe the Prime Minister of Defense returns, maybe there'll be an atmosphere that's more, uh, uh, more uh, tolerant to, to, to the negotiations and less people will, uh, will demonstrate. The other thing that I think is, is uh, will we'll also test 
the, the demonstrator's leadership on this because there have been so many groups that were leading the demonstrations. And then we'll see how, and they're still calling to, to protest. So on the one hand, they're very powerful. They're, they're, they're really, I don't know, dozens of groups who've united and they have sort of an, an organized themselves, but they're still going to demonstration. But then we'll see really who has the edge. Is it the, de the demonstrator's leadership? Will they manage to organize the people to come demonstrate? Or is the public at large still very independent and would sort of be, uh, we'll say, okay, this is a moment to rest. We have to, you know, we'll see what the government, if once the government continues, then we'll come and protest again. Now, to be fair, I think it doesn't really matter because I think that even if the public doesn't come and demonstrate right now in massive numbers as it did, that the, 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 the people who are demonstrating has been educated so they know what's going on, they get it. And so, and once the government will continue to do uh, its uh, initiatives to, to damage Israel, they'll come and protest in large numbers in, immediately. So, I think it's good that there will be some protests that will continue to, to maintain sort of uh, the, I don't know, the atmosphere, but once the government will continue, I'm, 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 I can, you know, I can commit to this. I, I believe that the figures will come, you know, in big numbers as they did until now. Yeah. So we've got a couple of different questions that sort of come off of that, the what's next. And of course, part of what's next, hopefully, eventually, right, goes to the political side. So, you know, one of the questions that, that came in here um, is, you know, are, are protesters, opposition leaders, is anybody out there, you know, explicitly calling for new elections, early elections, obviously? And do you think that that's where this is headed? And then along with that, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen, and I'm sure many people on this call have seen, you know, some of the polls that have come out recently that show that if there were an election today, which of course there isn't, so it's worth what it's worth, but you know, that Likud has gone way down, that Benny Gantz's party has has taken the lead, so to speak, Lapid's party has grown, and that, you know, as things stand right now, you would have the capability, if you count who the parties currently in the opposition, uh, they would be the majority. So what do you think is, what's the discussion, I would say, and, you know, where do you see that going? So really, I don't know. I think the key, the key person here is, of course, Netanyahu. Because again, from where, the way I see things, I think the ultra orthodox could get to what they want, most of it. The national religious can get what they want, most of it. And the Likud is, is just so weak in, in, you know, in comparison to Netanyahu, to their leader, that he can shut them down. But then he doesn't get what he wants, which is an out of jail card. So, how does he maneuver this? How does he cancel his trials and maintain prime minister? Because no one from his coalition wants election. Because the ultra orthodox wants to be in parliament, in, in government, the national religious want to be in government, and then they could want to be in government because it's a lot of power, it's a lot of influence, it's a lot of budgets. It's you know they can dictate policy at the end of the day, but except Netanyahu, who doesn't get his out of jail card, and and the opposition, of course, they want to tackle Netanyahu and they want elections and I'm now more, more powerful than him in the polls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But on the other hand, they also understand that they can't sort of make it about Netanyahu. They have to make it about his policies. And if they're smart and they get it, then they also understand that because Netanyahu, they have that in order for Netanyahu to get his out of jail card, he must continue this policy. So for them, it's not to tackle to they, they don't want to attack Netanyahu directly. They want to tackle his policies because they know that it's it unites together. It's actually the same agenda. And then they are perceived as more sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, more about the, the, the content and that it's not a personal thing with Netanyahu, it's more about his policies, et cetera. Uh, but again, we don't know where this would go and how this would end up. And the politics is so, uh, so unpredictable here and things couldn't, nobody could have imagined this. So it's, it's really hard to tell. Yeah. I mean, I realized as I was asking that it's obviously incredibly important because that's ultimately what the change is going to be, but it's also pretty impossible to answer. So thank you. Um, but I, I do want, okay, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I just want to say that two things. Like on the one hand, like I think the optimist side is to see how the Israeli liberal camp in Israel regrouped and how much power it has. So even though we don't have any power in the politics, 
We have so much power over the politics. Once we regroup, we really everybody, all the various groups in Israel grouped on this. And that's one thing. On the other hand, is still and to see how far the occupation of the two-state solution is from this kept agenda. They get some of it, but a lot of it is still, there's a lot of blind spots still. And the third thing that I would say is also look at the small, smaller things in parentheses that are being passed that are still very dramatic. The fact that they approved 7,000, 7,200 housing units, the fact that they, you know, canceled the disengagement from the north part of the West Bank, the fact that Smotrich has now authority over, this is like really an annexation move, an unparalleled annexation uh, uh, decision that the government made, which went really almost under the radar. And it's unheard of. You know, now, you know, I'll, I'll try to explain. The fact that, that you know, that Israel is, is occupying the occupied territory. So, there's a, so Israel is not sovereign over the occupied territory in legal terms. There's a military. The Israeli military is responsible, is the, in the shoes of the sovereign that's running the occupied territory, that's running the Palestinians. Now, what they did by this move is to give Smotrich, to give uh, uh, the, uh, a minister, uh, so they took parts from this military regime and they made it civilian. So now there is the, the settlers are connected. Uh, to really, now if you can't, it's hard to argue in any legal terms that there aren't two different legal regimes. You know, we could have argued this before, but now it's it's also legally speaking. Which uh, anyway, if you want the interruption, but just to be clear, when you have you know two different legal regimes under the same power under international law, that has a name and it's called apartheid. So whether yeah. We, any of us, choose to use that word or not, or whatever people may think about that, that uh, unequivocally fits the the in international legal definition. So keep, please. And and and, and I must say, and I know apartheid resonates with, with different people on different levels, and it also has a, a, a symbolic, like a, you know, people feel about it different things. And yeah, but really, we I think that if you want to understand what's happening, is that. You know, people from the mainstream of Israel, people from the military, from the heart of the military, people get it. People are not hesitant to say that the national religious leadership, the politics of the national religious in Israel, this is what they want, this is what they aim. And frankly, this is the practice. What we have in the occupied territories today is exactly this. It's, it's, a, it's a territory with two different legal systems in the purpose of, of maintaining it this way to give one group uh, uh, powers over the other to discriminate in a systematic way. This is what they want. Now, for for us, for the liberal camp inside Israel, we are, you know, we build, our sort of assumption is that our camp, on the one hand, doesn't care, uh, doesn't live under occupation, therefore doesn't feel the urgency to end the occupation. On the other hand, they don't care about the settlements either. Uh, so this is allowing the settlers to sort of came into power to do all, to, sh to, 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 to do their, what's important for them, to make this policy. And the majority of the Israeli public is accepting of it, is sympathetic toward it, doesn't mind it so much. And our sort of challenge is, how do we make the liberal camp in Israel understand that this is so harmful uh, for, the, uh, for the Palestinians first and foremost, but also for Israel and for the sake of Israelis uh, in our future? Yeah. So I have two different questions that I want to ask you. I'm just looking at the time. I want to get to more of these. So one, um, you know, we got a question in from somebody who um, wrote that, you know, she had been there in Israel during the, the cottage cheese demonstrations a few years ago, and that there was a lot of conversation, a lot of discussion about, you know, making the occupation and issues around the occupation, uh, a, you know, central part of that. And there were uh, you know, and it was part of some of the protests, but then basically as soon as those protests stopped, obviously the occupation part was was out of the conversation. And do you think there's anything, do you think all, any of what you've been talking about now makes this different? And can we, can we hope for better sort of coming out of this? And then the second question that's come up from a couple different pieces is, you know, can you talk about the participation or lack of participation um, from non-Jewish Israelis? in the protest movement. And then there were actually specific questions. Somebody wanted to know whether there have been any protests in any you know, Ar Arab cities and towns. Um, again, we're talking you know, within Israel proper, not in the occupied territories. And whether there have been any protests, any support 
from settlers. Okay. So in regards to the cottage cheese protest, which was uh, 12 years ago now, uh, or almost 12 years ago, I think, look, there are many differences. One, I think, is that the majorities in Israel feel this is an exist existential threat. The protest at that time was perceived by many people in Israel as that the uh, privilege that are demonstrated because of their, their, their economic status was sort of in decline. So the children of the rich, in different words, were protesting because they can't live to the standards that their parents lived in. And the, in the heart of the protest was from the center of Tel Aviv, was from the mainstream. They were trying to socialize it, but this was sort of the leadership. This was the core. It was about this. And it ended. It was huge. It was sincere. It was genuine. It was about real issues. And they made a lot of success in educating the public at the time. But it also ended once, you know, the government sort of made a, a compromise, they made you know, a committee, and here it's, it's an existential threat. It, it doesn't seem that the government is able to pursue its ambitions, the public will stand fiercely and they won't let it happen. And if they do, they won't follow. The military will collapse, the, the, economy, the economy will collapse, the education system won't continue, the academy won't, it, they won't be able to do this. This is the, the, the major difference. A second difference, I think, is that the demonstrators are seeing sort of forces that are pushing this. They are now angry at the ultra-Orthodox leadership, not at the ultra-Orthodox, but at the ultra-Orthodox leadership. They're saying, look, if you want to be players, if you want to, uh, to make policy, then you, you can't be privileged. Uh, or the, and again, the politics, not the people, they understand that the ultra-Orthodox are one of the weaker populations inside Israel, but their leadership is, is problematic. And also with the national religious, they're saying, look, we, and, and they're getting it, they're pushing for this. So this is also a change in the game. They're seeing the, for, the forces that are pushing this. And at the time, it was a bit different. It was just like uh, the Netanyahu and, the, and what they were promoting in the economic sphere alone. Uh, so this is, this is, I think, some of the major differences. In regards to the Palestinian citizens of Israel, uh, I must say that it, they don't feel part of the demonstration. Uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, you, you have to be frank, and the Supreme Court was not, you know, it helped Palestinian citizens of Israel in many, in many issues, but in many issues it didn't. And discrimination against Palestinians in Israel exists today despite the, the Israeli democracy. And, uh, you know, Palestinians are lower class in Israel in essence, you know, they have their education is less good, their economy is less good. Their, the, the places they live is less, it, it, it's poor. In so many different ways, there's so much discrimination inside Israel that they just don't feel that the Supreme Court is there. You know, that, that's not what's going to you know, save them in this, in this place. It's not, it's not as urgent to them as it feels for the liberal Jewish camp in Israel. And the second is that you also have to be frank that the liberal camp in Israel is failing in addressing Palestinian issues, Palestinian citizens of Israel issues as well. They are preventing in many degrees from Palestinians to uh, participate as uh, speakers in demonstrations and to state their authentic agenda. So you don't hear issues about the occupation. You don't hear issues about full discrimination. The, uh, the, uh, you know, the law that described Israel as a Jewish state, the national the, uh, nation how do you call state it? law, the nation state law, for example. It's accepted by the majority of demonstrators. The liberal camp in Israel is still very, very blind to discrimination against Palestinians in Israel. And even when you see the, the political parties, they're not including the Palestinian Arab parties uh, in their discussion. They're not taking them seriously. They're taking them as a political actor that could help them or could not in toppling down Netanyahu or whatever, but not the sincere, equal sort of participants in the political game. So this is, I think, where the Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel stand. By the way, you don't see demonstrations of Palestinians, maybe in the margin, but I don't see any. Uh, you do see some intellectuals who get it, who understand, you know, they will suffer. If Israel becomes a full-headed dictatorship, they will suffer from this first and foremost. So you do see some intellectuals that say that you know Palestinians should participate, or this will harm them as well. But again, it's in the margins, in the fringe. It's not really uh, in the streets, not in Palestinian towns, nor within the large demonstrations. You don't see many participants. 
Now, as we're going to the settlers, I think you do see some. I think that one of the things that are happening is that a lot of the right wing in Israel is getting, is getting it. And, and I think more interesting that, for example, yesterday you had a right wing demonstration in support of the judicial change. Now, what happened was that the Israeli governors and Netanyahu, and they, they wanted this demonstration and started calling out all its supporters. But those who demonstrated was two groups. One, groups, one group was what we call the La Familia group. It's like a, a violent group, a, a very small group, I must say, in figure of violent citizens who are supporters of Netanyahu, who are on the fringe, on the margins of society, that has been neglected by Israeli society, that has been dismissed by Israeli society, that, that Israeli society has been racist towards them. And they've become very violent and, and they don't see themselves as part of society. And this is one, but this is a very small minority within the demonstrators of the right wing demonstrations. And 95% of the right wing demonstrations were settlers. Because the settlers, they, you know, I, I, I must say, I don't think there's such a thing as right wing demonstrations in Israel. There's the ultra Orthodox who demonstrate in regards to their sectarial sort of issues, and then the settlers. The other People who describe it as right wing don't go and protest in Israel. They're either in power or they don't have anything that's. And it's the settlers who are organized, who have money, who are financed in groups. They know how to get protesters to, to protest. And from my sort of uh, 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 take on yesterday's demonstration, it was the majority of settlers from, uh, from the settlements who came on buses, financed, and organized very well who came to the demonstration. And my prediction is that if we will start seeing right-wing demonstrations, it will actually be settler demonstrations who, because they're, they're, they're very organized and they know how to get uh, to do these sort of demonstrations. All right, one, one more question I wanna get in before we uh, bring on Jim, our board chair also. Um, you know, we of course here have been doing what we do and, and uh, working around this and working with many of our colleagues, everything from, organizing protests to greet Smotrich when he came to town, um, to you know, engaging with our elected officials here. Um, there's been a lot written about Biden's conversation with Netanyahu, you know, other pieces. Do you think the, the US response to this is resonating with Netanyahu, with Israeli political leaders? And I say the US response, I would include in that, obviously the administration and you know, congressional efforts that are going on, but also the the many Jewish organizations, including ones who, you know, frankly, have never done anything approaching this before, who have, have spoken out against what they're doing on the judicial revolution and against this process. Look, I'll say in this way, and I, and I don't know if I'll answer your question, but I think that, yes, that the U.S. administration that Biden has a huge role that will affect policy, that there are a few things that could actually influence Netanyahu and the US and the treatment by the US and the relationship with the US is one of them. Uh, I do think that, uh, yes, the US is doing, uh, you know, the fact that they haven't invited Netanyahu quite yet uh, uh, was very powerful and in the mainstream media, it got a lot of attention uh, and how the fact that they didn't meet with Smotrich was very powerful in, in in the way that the Israeli public got it. They said, look, even nobody's meeting these people. These are really crazy people. They're not legitimate. So this, is, this had a lot of resonance inside the Israeli public, the fact that uh, the US administration didn't meet with, with the, the Smotrich or is not inviting Netanyahu quite yet. And I think that the, the way the US responded following the legislation of the, the cancellation of the disengagement in the north of the West Bank was very powerful and resonated a lot inside the Israeli public. And nevertheless, I do think that it's still in a very symbolic level and has no influence on policy or doesn't have much influence on policy quite yet. And what I mean by this is that it seems that the international community in the US still doesn't have like uh, as the stick. You know, they have the carrots. They, everybody wants to maintain good relations with Israel, shared values, the only democracy in parentheses in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera, our closest friends on the one hand, we want to do business, we want to promote it, that's the carrots. But the stakes are not very clear what they are. They seem to be only in the condemnation, right? So you summoned an ambassador, that's it's not heard of. The last time it happened was what, more than a decade ago. 
Uh, so three decades this, ago. It, sorry? Three decades ago. Three decades ago. So it's it really it's 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 hard to to so it's it is important, but it's still in the symbolic uh, uh, field, it, and it doesn't have too much uh, leverage in, in regards to actual policy. And if you look at the movement of the Israeli policy, it's a one stream movement, right? In 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 regards to the occupied territories, in regards to the two state solution. So now they advance seven thousand units. Now they and they uh, approve. 15 outposts. Now the administration is angry. They'll wait four months, five months, and they'll do, they'll approve another 3,000, another 5,000, another 8,000. And that's, and, and it, it's still, and, and Israel is sort of maneuvering around these condemnations where there really isn't an, an actual stick that's saying, okay, uh uh, enough is enough. We, we don't, you can't do this. And, and so this is where I, I think, is, this is, I think, the, the large portion of the relationship. Uh, and I mean, you know, needless to say, there is a, a lot of conversation that, that we and others are having here in Washington with the White House and the State Department and Congress uh, along those exact lines. Uh, with that, I would like to welcome to the conversation uh, our board chair, Jim Klotznik. Hello, Jim. Thank you, Dar. Uh, hello, Lior. Good to see hello. you again. Likewise. After being in Israel uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, I'd like to pick up sort of where you were leaving off with the United, with the question of the United States, because Americans for Peace now is an American organization in conjunction with Shalom Akshav, you and Israel, which I think gives us sort of a unique perspective also. I think the history of America in this whole situation, I want to just get to that issue, is, is to try to make peace. Uh, and has worked assiduously to do that with uh, many Israeli uh uh, prime ministers, uh, starting with the primary peace agreement with Egypt and, and with Likud uh, from the time it took over. Also, uh, it, it's worked with uh, Israel. Uh, and I think looking uh, generally to the idea that it really takes two sovereign people living side by side, call it nation, call it confederation, call it, uh, you know, one state, two, whatever it is, it's peace. And, but it's recognizing the, uh, the rights of the Palestinians to sovereignty. Uh, and I think, quite frankly, from everything I've been reading and what I've heard today as well, you're really in a sort of an existential fight between Israelis at this point. The uh, Palestinians have assiduously sort of, whether they're living in Israel or in uh, the occupied territories, have not entered into this fight. This is, I think, between you know, sort of liberal, secular, relig religious side of whether whether they are uh, secular or religious on one side, and the right wing side of the country, the uh, the ultra orthodox, the, the the liquid party, particularly, which I think is the one who's sort of turned Israel generally to the right wing since it became uh, in power in '77 for the first time, and uh, and has held most of those. Uh, uh, positions, uh, uh, prime minister positions during that time. So, uh, and the other side of it is uh, not only uh, has there not been any reconciliation between the left and right wing of uh, Israel, uh, uh, the right wing is growing much quicker, the greater birth rate and whatnot. And I think this is, a, this is really a do or die situation for, for you guys on that side who we support. Uh, and I think uh, I'm hoping America understands it in that regard, particularly our government. And certainly, we as an American organization try to try to convince our government, be it in the legislative side or in the administrative side, of uh, of, of the validity of of the Oslo Accords, the concept of the Oslo Accords having two two states. And I hope, and I just encourage. Uh, and I know we will continue to do that here, uh, our government, uh, uh, to deal as they are doing it, apparently, at this point, uh, understanding that uh, this is not a usual situation. And the last thing I want to talk about is Netanyahu. He's not to be trusted. He's got, as you talk about, our monopoly get out of jail free card uh, as his main interest in this whole thing. And it, it just seems to me that for one man's uh, 
of one person's, whether it's man or woman, but particularly in this case, a man uh, who is, is proven time and again uh, that his self-interest is, is more important than that of, of the state of Israel. And I think you are in, a, in an existential situation at this point. Uh, I hope these, uh, these, uh, these kind of demonstrations that are going on will only grow uh, in numbers uh, and, uh, and stand up against this. Uh, I just, I feel that's certainly what we're going to be pushing for. I shouldn't say we, I'm just the chair. I'm now, I'm now speaking as a member of the board uh, and uh, chair just as a, a coordinator anyhow, that's not the point. I, 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 I believe our board is generally in this direction. And if there are some who disagree with it, they'll have a right to, to speak up and we'll, and we'll work that out between us. But our relationship between uh, APN and, and Shalom Akshav is rock solid. We're with you 100% on all of this. And I uh, just want to let you know that. Please take it back to our friends who you, uh, who you run. Indeed. So I, want to say, I want to say one thing, or two things, please. And, and one, I want to say thank you. And I can't, you can't understand how much your support is meaningful uh, for us as a movement in Israel and uh, for our people uh, who support us. It really enables us to do a lot, a lot of the things that we're doing right now is due to your support. Uh, and, and, uh, and right now, now is a time for action, but also for thinking, to analyze. And, and what we're doing now is on the one hand, we're participating, but we're also trying to observe and strategically take, make use of this sort of pivotal point in order to utilize it for, for our interests to understand, as you said, that this is actually not just a game between uh, you know, uh, between the Israelis uh, and the political camp, but actually this is there's a conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, and this is an existential threat to Israel. And uh, and Palestinian lives matter, and, uh, and Israelis can't be occupied. And there are so many different things that we have to really make, we have to sort of take the fruits from this because there is a political education that's happening and we want to sort of figure it out. How do we make it? The second thing that I wanted you to note, and maybe I should have said this earlier, is that you know the Israeli public at large was very critical on, on us when we were supported by you guys, or when we were giving support, we were getting support from uh, European countries, or when they see it as an intervention in many ways due to really uh, propaganda against human rights, against peace groups, etc., by right wing, by your other right wing groups. Now you see that demonstrators they demonstrate against uh, against in front. Of the U.S. Embassy in Tel Aviv, in front of the German Embassy in Tel Aviv, in front of the French Embassy in Tel Aviv, in front of the U.K. Embassy, in, the British Embassy in Tel Aviv, saying we want you to intervene. Netanyahu is taking us to a place where we won't be a democracy. Please intervene. Please use your power to intervene. So there's really a cry from the Israel, the liberal camp in Israel, to the U.S., to Biden, to the entire world, to come and intervene because this is really a real danger to to the Israeli citizens. So. Make it what you feel. All right, Lior, thank you let so me much. Just, just, let me just say one thing in regard to that. I, I know we may be running over. Uh, I, I appreciate those those words. And uh, I think that um, uh, at this point, the best thing that could happen, this is my personal opinion, is that there be new elections. And uh, hopefully you guys will press it to that point where that becomes apparent to the Israeli people. Anyhow, sorry, Adar. That's all right. Thank you, Jim. Lior, thank you for joining us. And again, thank you to everybody else who took the time out to be with us today. Uh, and we'll share the recording of this so you can share it with other folks who maybe weren't able to join. And we appreciate you all and we look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Adar. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Shalom, George.